How about now? Is that good? Good morning, everyone. I know it's bright and early this morning. I, I think I just woke up the guys in the back. I apologize. Uh, if, if you would like a little nap, please leave the room right now. Hopefully we can facilitate for that for you guys. Uh, I know this is probably not the most exciting topic in the entire world, patch management. Woo! I, I, I see you guys now jumping on the tables, doing a little jig. This is, this is exciting. A uh, little bit about me. So up until about a year and a half ago, I, I took this journey a year and a half ago. Prior to that, uh, hardcore system admin, okay? So I, I've, I've been, been over patch management. I've been over pretty much everything. I worked 10 years for Ancestry.com. I took, helped take them from 50 servers to 6,000 servers over 10 years. Every piece in a data center at one time I've, I've, I've touched. Uh, I've lived your guys' personal living hells before. I, I get it, guys. I've spent nights in data centers. I, I understand, okay? And so about a year and a half ago, I had an opportunity to come out to become an auditor. And I, I know for some of you guys, you're thinking, auditor, he switched to the dark side. He's no longer Jedi. But no, what happened, it's been interesting. Uh, for the last 53, 62 straight weeks now, I have been on the road, Monday to Friday, all over the country working with small companies and large Fortune 100 companies from both ends of the spectrum. And the kind of work that I'm doing is I'm going out and, and doing pretty much health assessments, uh, uh, looking at their identity management system and telling them every reason why they're horrible at it or doing PCI assessments or NIST cybersecurity assessments. Uh, the company I work for is called Protivity. Uh, there, that's the end of the sales pitch. We're done. So as I, as I said before, uh, one of the biggest problems that I faced uh, was how do you manage patch management on those thousands of servers? Now, I'm going to correct myself. We're going to go away from saying patch management because patch management is a naughty word. It really is a naughty word. It's like doing backups. The mindset is wrong. It's broken. You shouldn't be doing backups. You should be preparing for restorations. I know it sounds a little like a big mouthful to say, I'm preparing for a restoration, but the major vast majority of people that do backups, when they go to do the, rest, the restore, they fail because their focus is on doing the backup and not on doing the restore. Same with patch management. Patch management's the same kind of thing. We're focused on just applying patches, but what we're really focused on is vulnerability management. And so the talk here is going to be focused more on how do we, how do we remediate vulnerabilities not just how do we apply patches. So HP, they, they released a report recently saying, while it is laudable, I, I love that HP would use such a strong word, that Microsoft and Adobe both released more patches than at any point in history. It remains unclear that if this level of patching is sustainable, it strains resources of both the vendor developing the patch and, com and customers deploying the patch. Yes, absolutely, I, gr I agree with them. The, the rate at which the vendors are releasing, uh, that vulnerabilities are discovered in software, it's increasing at a rapid rate. But yet, we're not given more resources, more staffing to apply these patches. So then, what, in result, what happens is we, we're becoming more and more vulnerable to, to attack. You know, and it, it's, I find it fascinating that the most commonly exploited vulnerability of last year was a vulnerability discovered five years ago. And a patch was released five years ago. Why is that the most, that tells you consistently up, across the board. If you're a big company or a small company, the bad guys are still getting in with, with, with an exploit that's five years old. 
And as I've traveled across the country and been working with organizations, both big and small, this is absolutely correct. I see this very consistently. Doesn't matter if you're big or small, you're still able to get into that, that five-year-old exploit from five years ago. So, like I said before, we're gonna focus on vulnerability management, not just patch management, it's how do we get rid of those vulnerabilities that exist on those servers and on all those workstations. So there's three, three parts of a vulnerability management system. The first is around patch management. The second is around secure configuration management. And then the third is around code review. So the software that you do develop in-house, do you have the ability to assess the security of that code? So that when you are releasing it, do you have a program in-house that you can that you are able to apply those patches to your own code. So there's kind of three phases to, to a vulnerability system. You'll see discover. First, we need to discover what vulnerabilities exist on all of our, our, our assets. The second is to classify them. You should always have a program that, that you can address and classify. Is this a high, medium, or low vulnerability? And then the last is to remediate. You go out and fix it. And notice, I put a big arrow that takes you back at the beginning. Who here has ever applied a patch before? And then you have to apply a patch for the patch. Yes, yes, this, this happens. You have to. So just applying a patch doesn't mean you're done. And also it means that, well, there could be a patch for the patch. Now, as I have literally deployed millions of patches over the years, what I have found is a dirty little secret that a lot of people don't want to talk about. For example, in Microsoft, when you apply a Microsoft patch, the, the built-in Microsoft mechanism, when you apply a patch, is at the end of the patch, the, the, the patch executes, the program executes, and then it writes a registry value and saying, I'm installed. I've, I've reached the end of my installer, we're installed. Well, the problem is, is that Microsoft patches don't actually validate that the right DLLs and the right registry keys got to actually installed correctly. So what, is com what commonly happens is that in a very small percentage that you, a, a machine will actually show that it, it has been patched. But when you scan it with a vulnerability scanner, it still, still shows that that's, that system is vulnerable and is missing the patch. Even though the, the, the machine is like, hey, I have the patch installed. It doesn't mean that the right registry keys and the right DLL files actually got installed correctly. This is why it's so important after you patch to rerun a vulnerability scan again to, make, to validate, yes, it did, pat, it, it did actually patch correctly. So, the first part of, of, of vulnerability patch management program is you need to have a, a great asset management program. There has been so many times where, where companies have been compromised because they didn't know about a, a server that was sitting in a closet in this, this remote branch location. You need to have the ability to identify all the assets on your entire network. Even if it's some little Raspberry Pi that, that a developer has plugged into a, a remote network jack somewhere. You, that could be vulnerable too. So you need the ability to manage and identify all assets on your entire network. So it's vital that you have that step. The next, the next one is you need patch management tools. Patch management tools can include things like uh, 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 SCCM, Yum, Big Fix, WSUS, that's great. The problem that I see in a lot of the organizations that I am working with on a daily basis is they're great at OS patches. They do wonderful, they're like, hey, I've applied all my Microsoft patches. Where they're consistently failing, consistently is third-party patch management. So, Adobe patches. Uh, uh, probably are, are some of your worst. Uh, 
Flash, Adobe, all these other uh, third-party uh, applications that we put on our, our desktops and our servers, they are horribly, horribly uh, vulnerable, but organizations that, that just use SCCM or just use WSUS, out of the box, that doesn't address those third-party patches. So when I walk in and I do a vulnerability scan against them, I see that they're vulnerable to all, all these things, all these ways. And when we do a pen test, it's like a heyday because we can get, it's so easy to get in. Your vulnerability patch management program has to look holistically. It has to look at all vulnerabilities that exist on the entire box and not just Microsoft patches or not just Red Hat or Linux patches. You need to have a vulnerability scanner. Uh, there's great commercial ones out there. Uh, Nexpose is great. Uh, Nessus, uh, a free and open source uh, great alternative that's made a lot of maturity in the last few years is OpenVos. Because of open, OpenVos, no one in this entire room now has an excuse of not doing vulnerability management. There's no free passes anymore. Everyone has the ability to scan for vulnerabilities. You need to, to look at code reviews. If you guys are developing code, part of your vulnerability management program is how are you going to address that code that you write? And then lastly, very importantly, do you have an exploitation tool? Now, can someone come to the microphone up here and tell me the difference between a vulnerability scanner and an exploitation tool like Metasploit? I've got licorice. That's all I got, my friends. Who can help me out here? Really? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so what he said was that, that it's a little bit more active. It, it touches a little bit more than a vulnerability scanner. So, so really, the biggest difference is Something like a Nessus is going to go out and say, hey, this web server is running this exact version. And so I know because you're running this exact vulnerable, this version, that because of that, you are vulnerable to these particular exploits. It doesn't actually try the actual exploit. It just sees and checks to see what versions you're running. And it just assumes if you're running this version, then, then you're vulnerable. An exploitation tool like Metasploit or Core Impact that's actually going to actually take the actual exploit and actually try the exploit on the server. Now, why would you think you would get very different results between the two, two different tools? Let me, let me tell you something. When Microsoft comes out and says, hey, this vulnerability, it is a high vulnerability. You must patch this tomorrow or you're going to go down. The problem is, is that when Microsoft releases a patching criticality of a patch or any vendor, they're, they're making the assumption that there are zero compensating controls. Now, what I mean by that is most organizations practice what's referred to as a defense in depth strategy. It's not just about having Microsoft on there. It's about, well, we're going to put antivirus software. We're also going to put uh, host uh, IDS or host IPS software on that box. We're also going to put application whitelisting on that box. We're going to have all of these additional security layers on, on each host. Now, when Microsoft says that this is a critical vulnerability, what they're saying is, well, we're assuming that's with no additional software. But typically, our organizations have these additional softwares loaded on, like AV and, and application whitelisting, on our servers. And the, those additional applications can actually remediate or completely remove the exploit. So one of my boxes that, that I've loaded all this stuff on, I try that critical vulnerability with Metasploit. I actually try the actual vulnerability, the actual exploit, and it's not vulnerable. So I'm not. I, Organizations that want to actually, from a maturity level, they want to be more mature and actually understand their actual risks, will, will use vulnerability scanning, but then they actually follow up with exploitation tools 
to actually, actually understand what their actual risk is. The problem is, is exploitation, exploitation tools actually have risk in themselves. If I, if I try exploiting a box, well, there's risk there. I could, I could actually bring down my production network when I actually tried that actual exploit. Another thing I commonly see in organizations, the, this common thread between organizations that are great at handling vulnerability management and the ones that aren't very good at it or horrible, is the ability that system admins have the ability to perform their own vulnerability scanning. So typically in a lot of organizations, what I see is that the perception that vulnerability management tools like like Nessus or uh, Nexpose, these are information security tools. These are the InfoSec guys. The InfoSec guys own these tools and they conduct all your scans. And then your patch management tools are owned by the, the sysadmins. If you can break this methodology, this thought process, that InfoSec owns those tools, and start getting your sysadmins to actually performing their own scans themselves and giving them the ability to perform their own vulnerability scans, it goes a long way. Because what happens is, is as part of your maintenance process, uh, they, they just start running their own scans. So before they put a new server in production, instead of calling InfoSec and saying, can you do the scan, they just have the ability just to do their own scan. Or if they, if they have the ability to, to perform their own scans, it's now embedded in part of their process. It, it's no longer InfoSec's problem to keep our, our boxes secure. It's now part of the IT problem to keep our boxes secure. So we talked about some of the patching maturity levels. I'll walk into an organization and patching is completely disabled. And, and the number one I, reason I hear is, if I start patching machines, it's gonna break stuff. So in, instead of addressing that, they just turn off patching. Uh, the next, the next, thing, next level of maturity up I see is, they just handle OS patches. They don't do third party patches. The next one I see is that, uh, you know, they have a great process around patching, uh, patching windows. Uh, most organizations, their executives will come in and say, I don't want a PC, I want a Mac. I know our company standard is PCs, but I'm an executive and I really don't care. So I'm just gonna go out and buy a Mac. Well, the problem is, is most organizations aren't adequately tooled to have the tools necessary to support from a patch and vulnerability management standpoint both PCs and Macs. Uh, it's not hard to support both. It's just, do you, do you have the ability, do you have the processes in place that you can patch both PCs and Macs? Uh, very common problem. It, the funny thing about that is that your executives are what I consider your highest value targets. So your highest value targets are actually the least secure because they want to run something that's out of process, that's not normally part of the, the standard for the organization. So let's look at some of our common risks that we commonly see around uh, patch deployments. Inadequate testing, okay? So <laughs> this is horrible. I see this all the time. So most organizations don't want to patch because they, they applied the patches and well, now they have to roll them back because stuff broke. Well, they didn't actually do any testing. They, didn't ha they don't have an environment that they can actually test their, their uh, patches before they put them in production. Do you, do you guys in this audience, do you have the appropriate place that you can test patches before you put them in production? You have, you have the kind of places that you can first install that patch first before you put it in production. The other common problem I see is while we have these great tools like Nessus, we have these other great tools, what we lack in the IT department is the ability to, to perform load testing. So while, 
when you do become to the maturity level of, yes, I can actually have a test environment. I can apply that test, that, that, that patch in a, in a test environment. Commonly, when we deploy that patch and we put it in production, and all of a sudden the server crashes because in a test environment, we don't apply any load to that. We don't simulate actual traffic, live traffic in that environment. So do you have the ability in your current testing pr process that you can actually simulate what, what actual load's gonna look like? Uh, commonly, I've seen problems where when you apply a patch to a server, all of a sudden your server's CPU goes up by 15%. Uh, when you actually put load on it. You need to be able to predict for that. So testing. If we spend more in testing, that's going to decrease our risk. There's, there's a relationship there. If we're willing to spend more in testing, it's going to decrease our risk that we have to roll a patch back. So there's this relationship between the two. So as we do more exercises around um, you know, testing, and uh, if we don't make the investment, it's going to cost us more to redeploy. It's going to cost us more for these tools. It's going to cost uh, cost more. But if we do do these things, it's going to reduce risk. So when I was in an organization and we were patching thousands and thousands of servers, I went to them and I. Uh, and I, I wanted to be able to tell the business how, how much we're spending a year on patches. What is our actual cost to the business for us to do patch management? Uh, just a quick survey right, right now. How many, in this, how many in this room could actually tell me, you don't have to tell me, but how, much, how many people in this room could tell me exactly what they're spending per year in patches? Any, can anyone... Could anyone tell me what they're spending per year to apply patches in an organization? I don't see a single hand, and this is very common. We, we keep saying that it's a lot of work, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of work, but we don't actually go to the, to, to the board of directors, or we don't actually go to senior management, and that we can actually quantify the ability to actually say, it's costing us X amount of money. Okay, so at an organization I was working with, when I did, did, ran this equation to find out actually what we were spending, I found that it was costing us $100,000 every single month for us to deploy patches to thousands of servers. Okay, $100,000, and that included all the labor to deploy the patch, the probability that we had ha of labor of that we're gonna have to roll the patch back, the amount of testing that it took, all of this time and money that we had spent on a, on a monthly basis. So it was costing us $1.2 million for us to deploy security patches per year to this organization. Our board of directors was, was stunned. They were completely stunned. And, and we said, hey, we're predicting that next year, the number of security patches that we're going to have to patch for, it's going to increase by 10%. We expect at least 10% more patches next year than, than we have today. And I would say that's completely realistic to expect between 10 and 20% more patches next year than this year. So we're gonna actually have to spend more money next year patching than we do today. And so does this mean that we can justify new headcounts? Yes, but you have to be able to tell the business of exactly how much it's gonna cost to patch. Modern day attacks now, if we look at Target, Home Depot, the way that they're breaking in today is different than they did a decade ago. It's this concept of pivot attacks. Uh, what a pivot attack is, is uh, actually, <clears throat> can someone explain what a pivot attack is here at the mic? I got licorice, okay. It's exactly what it is. What he said is that you get on one host and then you use that host to get onto another host. So what, what happened at the, at the target system, at Target was 
they were able to get into the HVAC system. So they were able to compromise the computer that was running the heating and air conditioning system, which they then used to pivot to a cash register, which they then used, once they compromised that, they could then get to a server, which they then used to get to another server. So the concept of, of, of I just have a really strong firewall on the perimeter, and that's what I'm going to focus on is the perimeter, that concept is dead, and it is incorrect. You need to treat every host on your entire network as a separate island. You need to have the same controls on every host that you would have on your perimeter, because they're attacking each individual computer on your network, and not just coming from the outside in. Uh, one, one of the very common penetration tests, when I, when I do penetration testing, one of the common approaches I take is I go up to the receptionist and, and I say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm embarrassed. I left my resume home. Can, can, here's my USB drive. Can, can you print out my resume for me? You know, and, and then once I've compromised that receptionist desk, then I can start pivoting around the network and get it, getting onto other servers. So you need to make sure you have the same controls from the perimeter that you have on each individual host. So we talk about, well, I can have two out of the three here. You know, I can have, I can spend a lot of money on, on value or cost, but how do I really get to a point where I'm balancing risk and cost? Especially now because we have a lot of these new regulatory compliance. Pretty much in every field now, we have regulatory compliance. Uh, most organizations now, it used to be ISO 27000. Everyone is hot to trot on NIST cybersecurity framework, NIST CSF. I do a lot of NIST CSF audits. Uh, I think it's very healthy. Uh, if you're a, an IT manager and you want to understand, well, how is my IT organization actually doing for information security? You can take the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework and, and actually have an auditor come in and say, okay, this is actually how we're doing. The problem is, is when you ask your IT guys, hey, are my system, hey, IT guys, are my systems secure? Your IT guys will always say, yeah, we're doing great. We do great. So it's really important that, that we have these, these compliance programs. But, you know, when, you, when an auditor comes in and audit you, uh, it's going to be tough. To, it's going to be bloody the first time. So we talked about before about practicing a layered approach. So these are the typical uh, layers that, that I like to see on, on servers these days, uh, from antivirus to, to uh, memory protection like Emmet uh, to host IPS, application whitelisting. Uh, if you look at the Australian Signals report that they come out every year, the, if you haven't read this report, you want to read it. What they do is they look at every breach that occurs every year, and and they look at it and and, and they they look at it and go, what what compensating control would have stopped this breach? Okay, and so what they found is that there's four basic security controls that would remove would have stopped 80 percent of all breaches pretty much every year. Uh, the, number one, the number one control is to have a, a, a apply Microsoft patches within 30 days. The next control is to apply third party patches within 30 days. The third one is to remove administrative privileges off of desktops so that your users don't have local administrator rights on, on desktops. And then the last one is to practice application whitelisting. Those four basic controls would stop 80% of all breaches by just those four. You don't need to go out and find this vendor that practices these fancy advanced uh, persistent threat attacks or things like that. Those things help, but bang for your buck are those four basic controls. So we talked about before what the difference is between vulnerability scanning and what, a, what an actual pin test is. It's actually trying that actual exploit and actually identifying what the risk, the actual risk level is, not a hypothetical risk level. 
So we talked about before about the, these phases of um, patch management. You know, we're create, taking an inventory, uh, actually an asset list, uh, performing the scan, doing the actual vulnerability scan, and then correlating it to actual risk. Just to speed up for a little, little, little bit in time's sake. Another way to, to reduce costs for a patching program. If you can put things in buckets and say, okay, these systems all have the same co configuration. So instead, what, what I found was that if I could test 10 test cases instead of 100 test cases, it, it, would, I, it would take me one-tenth the amount of time to do testing. So the more that you can, you can put your, your systems into buckets and say, okay, all of these servers have exactly the same exact applications loaded on them, so we're going to, we're gonna, we're gonna do the testing, the end-to-end -end smoke testing for this systems all together at once. So if you have a, a hundred different servers, you shouldn't have to do a hundred different tests to validate that the patches didn't break. You want to reduce those testing sets. When, when you do your actual exploiting, you, you want to actually focus on those potential ones that, that could actually be exploited. So when I was spending $1.2 million on patching, what, what I went to management and did is says, hey, let's stop patching every month. I don't want to spend $1.2 million every year. What I do want to spend is, let's look at the actual risk. Let's actually try to actually do the exploits. Let's do pen testing. And let's, the only time we're going to now patch is not every month. We're only going to patch when all of our compensating controls fail. So if Microsoft releases a patch and and uh, say my application whitelisting was able to remediate that. When I did my scan, I actually write down, oh, my application whitelisting stopped this patch. I'm not gonna apply that patch that month. I'm only gonna apply patches when all of my controls fail. So I went from patching every single month to between once and twice a year. Because I would, when I did patch, I would apply all the, all the missing patches but then I was only patching once or twice a year because I would only patch when, when all my controls failed. So we talk about you only want to, you only want to apply those, those uh, you want to do the exploitation tools, you want to identify which ones that your compensating, compensating controls miss. Uh, you want to reduce the test cases, the inventory, and So who should decide when to patch? Should it be IT's decision of when to patch? I disagree. Who should decide when to patch it? You should be making it a business decision when to patch, not an IT decision. You should be able to go to the business and say, hey, our, our existing infrastructure, we now have this increased amount of risk because, uh, so, does it make sense financially because of this increased risk for us to patch? Don't treat patching as just a monthly maintenance program. The problem with monthly maintenance programs is they never complete, they never finish. I typically will see organizations, I'll go to an organization and I say, this patch hasn't been uh, applied like in, in, in two years, why is that? Well, you know, we just never, we just never did it. Because they don't view as, as when you deploy patches as an actual project. You want to you wanna view patching as a project that has a start and a finish. And if you can't finish, you need a, an exception process. So don't view patching as maintenance. View it as an actual project that will, if you can reduce the number of times that you have to patch a year, then view it as here's a project. And I'm going to have a project manager, and I'm going to, and I'm going to manage it. Uh, also, there's other cases where you can't apply patches every month. I do a lot of work at hospitals now. 
and I see a lot of medical devices and the medical device manufacturer says you cannot apply any patches to this box unless we have pre-approved. So if you have like a defibrillator machine, they're like, you can't apply any OS patches at all to this defibrillator unless we, we've, we validated it first. So oftentimes you need to be able to understand what the risk is for those machines that you can't patch. Because there will be machines you cannot patch. So I want to have a, a, a discussion now around if you have machines that you can't patch, what can we do? And then any questions that you guys have at all. So I just want to open this up. Uh, there, there's a microphone right there. Uh, let's, let's have a discussion. Are you going to whip them and make them come up there? I fear her a little bit, so. Yeah, yeah come up to the microphone. Uh, that way that the people, if you come to the microphone, it makes it nice for the people that are watching it on, you, on YouTube. So uh, uh, we won't show your face on, on TV, but. Yeah. So uh, it seems like we're going at this maybe all backwards. You know, we're trying to examine our machines externally, and, and you know, we're somewhat limited. Do you see any maturity in the markets where the servers are becoming uh, self-aware of their security status, uh, where they start reporting on their vulnerability, they start reporting on their exploitability, they start reporting on their patching uh, maturity. It seems like that would be a better way to do it, that the uh, servers are self-retained. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I've done implementations for, for products out there. There's products like, like uh, IBM's Big Fix, and, and there's some other products on the market today, which actually puts agents on the boxes themselves. And with those agents, uh, there's a constant communication. Same with SSCM, Microsoft SSCM. There's this constant communication between now of, uh, you know, every, every several times a day, the agent's going out, looking on the server, seeing what patches are missing, and then proactively reporting back to a centralized server. And so the nice thing about that is you now have a single pane of glass that from a reporting standpoint, you can look and all of your machines are reporting in instead of, like you said, this the, having to go out and do scanning, which is, I agree, which is broken. So that's the trend in the industry now is, is the ability to put agents out on machines. And the reason why you need agents now is it's not just about Microsoft patches, it's about all applications. The other, the other common problem I see is, is these scanning programs, like ones for Microsoft, are just Microsoft-centric. But m almost all of my clients now are running heterogeneous environments. It's not, it's not just about Microsoft anymore. It's about Macs, it's about Linux. So how, do you have the ability for all machines in your organization to report back their status, and not just your Microsoft ones? So yes, I totally agree that, that since the, the concept of vulnerability management is a, is a moving target that changes every, literally every hour. Every hour a, a new patch comes out. Having a static scanning program fails. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. So ha having the ability to have this single pane of glass, this dashboard on what is my current state and what is my tolerance for the number of days out of compliance for a server, and is there reporting capabilities that people are actually getting notified when we're out of compliance from a patching perspective? And, and looking at it as a holistic program. Great comment. Uh, any, please, anyone else?
Has anyone, uh, is anyone doing anything with, their, with, with patch management that's maybe a little bit different that you guys are seeing success with? You guys must be rock stars at this. That's awesome. Well, it sounds like, uh, any other questions before I wrap up? Yeah, go ahead. Great question. So what he said, what, what he said, to repeat what he said is how do you document so that when you do get audited by an auditor like me, the first thing I'm gonna ask is, why didn't you apply that patch to that system? You need to be able to have a documented process that you can show the auditor and say, this is why we didn't patch. The, here's the compensating control that we have in place to, to stop that exploit. Because it's not about the patch, it's about the exploit. At the end of the day, we're most concerned about the exploit, not, not the patch. This is how we're stopping that exploit. And, and you have to do that. This can be a very costly exercise. It, for a lot of organizations, it's just cheaper to patch every month because you need to have that ability from an auditability standpoint that you can show an auditor. So uh, you have to have that exception process and you have to document it. I've done it through SharePoint. Uh, I, I, I don't like the concept of just emails. You need to have a central repository of, of why you're not patching and what you're doing to, to compensate for that. I saw another, any other follow-up questions? So what I, what I was doing is, is actually running Metasploit in Core Impact and saying, okay, here's the actual CVE number for this actual exploit. I used I used Core Impact or Metasploit to actually try that to actually try that actual exploit, and when I tried the exploit, uh, looking at the log files for my application whitelisting, I saw that that it caught that exploit, and and that so I then report to that auditor that this here's the evidence that this compensating control, the application whitelisting, stopped that particular attack. It, it's a lengthy process because you're going to have to do that for every missing vulnerability on a box. I mean, every missing patch on the box. So it's a, it's a, it's a cost-benefit analysis if, if you want to go that direction. It just depends. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, it's important to understand how much you're spending on patching so you can understand if, if, if that model is right for you or not. Because it's not, it's not right for everyone. Is that... There was a, a question back there. Yeah, I uploaded them before. I made a few changes last couple, uh, on the flight last night. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, please, uh, if you'd like, uh, come up and, and give me a business card or something, or I'll give you a business card and I will send you a copy of the, the most recent slides. Happy to distribute any. Uh, bonus round. If, if you do come up and give me your contact information, I'll share with you some of the things that when a company asks me to come in and audit their patch, patch and vulnerability management program, I'm happy to share with you the actual audit elements that I actually, I'll actually do during an audit. Here's my audit program to actually audit a patch and vulnerability management program. Anything else? Yeah, back here. Absolutely. What, what he's saying is when you remove administrator, administrative access for local users, this is a PR nightmare. Uh, it, you're talking about when, when you remove local administrator rights, you're talking about a big change in company culture. Users are used to being able to do something a certain way, and it's so hard when you pull them back and saying, no, you can't do that anymore. 
my biggest advice to you is before you start any of these initiatives is these initiatives have to be approved by your board of directors or by senior management. First off, they're usually the biggest offenders. So, so be, being, having them uh, have the avail availability to, to come back and say, you can't, you can't do that. It has to come from a higher power. It needs to come from upper management and saying, upper management is telling us we have to do this. This is what we have to do. Not, this is something that the IT guys. When that notification comes out, don't have it come out from IT. This needs to come out, this notification that we're, we're removing administrative privileges needs to come from, uh, from the HR department or legal. Don't make this an IT problem because it's a marketing issue, okay? So if you can have legal driving this that we're removing administrative access, I've seen more success in organizations being able to do that. Then it's about training and education of, of what, what a company of resources actually you're supposed to do on a company resource and what you're supposed to do on your cell phone during break. So, so yes, absolutely, I, I agree with you, but you gotta push it from the top. You can't make this an IT problem. Uh, did we have till the top of the hour or 9.45? Okay, uh, we have time to, for any other questions. That was a good question, by the way, I like that one. Okay, oh, one more, one more. Dives in, right, right at the last second. Yeah, so, so some type of risk, risk registry, some, some type of that. that. So basically, you need to be able to quantify a missing patch. You need to be able to quantify that to an actual risk. And what the likelihood of risk is, just like in, I, I don't know if IT guys, how many here are IT guys? How many, how many are from audit? How many are for, from, from upper management? What, what percentage are, are sysadmins here? About a third of you are sysadmins. How about, how about IT audit? What, a good 20% of you here. Um, so IT guys aren't used to being able to quantify risk to a business. That's usually, that's usually an IT information security role, okay? So at the end of the day, you need to be able to, to say, okay, what is the, the likelihood of compromise? What's the financial risk financially if, if they do compromise? What's the, what's the dollar impact? Being able to translate, well, this is a high critical patch to, well, this potentially could cost us X millions of dollars because it could actually shut down the entire organization. That, that's the kind of risk that you need to be able to report up to up, upper management. Being able to translate that into actual risk and saying, okay, this, this missing, missing patch could lead to our business being shut down or th our, be our business not being able to pass a regulatory audit and so the government will remove our, our ability to do business. They're, they're gonna shut us down because we, we, we have these missing patches on our machines. And we have to prove to, from a regulatory standpoint that we're compliant. Is that what you were after or was there a different is that good? I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay, anything else? Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it.